All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a brand new episode of Student of the Gun Radio. Yes, indeed. We got a lot of fantastic stuff for you guys today. Thank you very much for joining us. We're going to talk once more to our good friend Alex Bosco, the OG of Pistol Braces. We talked to him previously. Uh, it was about a year and a half ago. We talked to him. Was it about? Yeah, it was like a year and a half. I don't or at least remember. I was trying to figure that out when I was on with him. I'm like, dude, I, I think it's been like a year or two. It, I don't. It, it's been like it, a year. And we, he warned us what was coming. He's like, look, this is what's coming. You've got to get involved. And we're going to talk more about where we are today as a nation um, in that regard. And so you can decide. So we're 1176. I see the 76, and I think the spirit of 76 or whatever. Uh, 1176. But. Uh, we got a, a Dirk. Well, the answer is, uh, I was like, the answer is episode 1063. That was on 6 16, 2021. We had special report, the state of braces with Alex Bosco. Well, there you go. That's almost two years. Wow. Yeah. At least a year and a half. So, all right. Crazy. So Dirk, we've got Brownells bullet points for you. going to talk about a two a day two a second amendment day and what that's all about. And we're going to talk about sharp things. Uh, we've got a, a question uh, from the, the inbox uh, for our student of the gun homeroom for you guys today. So we got a lot of good stuff for you. You are not going to regret being here. And with not, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it back over to Zach. Welcome to Student of the Gun Radio, planting freedom seeds since 2013. Here we don't just talk about guns and gear. We also discuss current events and politics because guns are politics. Now, sit back, relax, and allow today's episode to drip ever so gently into your ear. Please welcome your co-hosts, founder of Mastermind Media and Consulting Group, Jared Markle, and the shipping ogre, Zach Markle. Now, give it up to your beloved host, the Pimp Hand of America, Professor Paul Markle. All right, ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, uh, at Jared and Zach, have you seen what's going on in Ohio? Yeah. The, they freaking, like, East I, Lebanon. Yeah, East Palestine. Palestine. East Palestine, Ohio. Uh I don't yeah. I'm not sure how far away Chernobyl, Ohio. Yeah, where from where we used to live, uh that is. But uh authorities blew up the train. East Palestine, Ohio is undergoing an economic uh, ecological disaster because authorities blew up the train, derailed derailment cars carrying hazardous chemicals. There's a photo about of that. this. Can you drop a story in? Because I, I heard that they burned the chemicals. Apparently, they set it on fire and it exploded and it oh like my gosh. mushroom clouded. Uh, yeah, this uh, my buddy Cork I, just sent me this link. Yeah, I saw that they uh, they were issuing warnings to the residents of the local area because the wells in the water were affected and contaminated contaminated with the chemicals and i was like man the the wells that's the people's and the animals source of water yeah. on farms so what the farfignugan uh let me see if this will if this will send to you jared i got it in the notes zach pulled one from wkbn.com okay. it says three additional chemicals discovered on east palestine train derailment yeah you know what first news was recently oh, informed man. Yeah, keep going. Of three more chemicals that were on the Norfolk Southern train that derailed in East Palestine just over a week ago. We were being told that those chemicals are dangerous. Uh, the Silcagiano, a hazardous material specialist, said that we basically nuked a town with chemicals so that we could get a railroad open. <laughs> the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency sent a letter to Norfolk Southern stating that ethylene glycol monobutyl ether and ethyl hexyl acrylate and isobutylene were also in the rail cars. Yeah, those are not good for humans. Cagliano wow. says ethyl hexyl acrylate is, is especially worrisome. He says that it's a carcinogen and contact with it can cause burning and irritation in the eyes, the skin and eyes. Breathing it in can irritate the nose and throat and cause coughing and sor shortness of breath. And my understanding is that that also well they did say it's a carcinogen a carcinogen and i'm pretty sure that, that causes lung cancer if you inhale yeah, it causes lung cancer yeah so i'm pretty sure that lung cancer that specifically that specific chemical chemical ethyl hexyl acrylate acrylate is uh 
a cause of lung cancer. <clears throat> Isobutylene is also known to cause dizziness and drowsiness when inhaled. Uh, Cagliano said that, quote, I was surprised when they quickly told the people they can go back home, but then said if they feel like they want their homes tested, they can have them tested. I would have far rather like they did all the testing. Okay, so East Palestine is right on the border with Pennsylvania. It's right over on the Pennsylvania border. Yeah. Oh. Cagliano says that it's possible some of these chemicals could still be present in homes and on objects until you clean them thoroughly. That's what a lot of ifs, and we're going to be looking at this thing 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the line and wondering, gee, cancer clusters could pop up. You know, well, water could go bad. Uh, one of the things, it's like with this, the train derailment, uh, one of the reasons that I was following it was obviously because I grew up in Ohio, but also yeah. because the displacement of people from their homes, mm -hmm. like if, if, if a government entity can force people to leave their homes, to me, that's an issue. That's a problem. What you should be able to do is, is inform people that, Hey, this has been, you know, these chemicals have been leaked into the ground and you're probably going to be drinking contaminated water. Uh, so here's the information and we recommend that you should probably like leave your house and not come back for a little while, but I don't think it should that anybody should be able to force people to leave their homes. Well, and, uh, I don't know if they were forced in this scenario or if it was recommended, but the initial reports that I saw said that people were threatened with criminal action if they didn't leave their houses up to and including child endangerment. Um, which maybe that's fair because if you choose to stay and your ch and your children get hurt, then it's your fault because you chose to stay. Well, what so, what if you inject your child, take your child to a doctor or a pharmacy, and they inject him with poison, and the kid ends up dying suddenly in high school? Isn't that child endangerment? Yeah. Your kid's walking down the hallway, has a has a cardiac arrest, falls over and dies. Isn't that child endangerment? If if you inject your child with with a a mystery drug. Uh, and they die or they're but, but it, it, east palestine is uh i'm looking at it i'm trying to figure like it it's it's south of youngstown it's just south east of youngstown ohio so if you guys are, are looking for a a uh, thing but the is it more than 10 miles away from millersburg oh uh, yeah oh yeah it's it's because that was there they said within one mile, but could potentially be hazardous within oh, ten miles. No, it's about it's about sixty miles, about okay. sixty miles away from Millersburg. So, uh, remember, you guys remember way back when I didn't mean to do this, but this just popped up in my news feed, and I was like, "This is kind of crazy." Uh, you guys remember when we did the the tub challenge with the Rubbermaid tub challenge back in the old studio, and yeah, we. Was yeah, I remember that. Because we did the can thing, and I said, what you should do is get one of those traditional however many gallons, 17 gallon, whatever, rubber made tubs, and put everything in there that you would need like for three days or whatever. You know, put some toilet paper in there, put some food, some canned food in there, put some, you know, whatever. I said, so if you ever had to, because we used to live in, you know, Hurricane Alley. We we lived right in an area where hurricanes were very common. And it was very common for people to have 24 or 48-hour notice, you got to get out of here because there's a Cat 3 hurricane about to hit the ground. And I said, rather than running around scrambling, you know, instead, just prepare the Rubbermaid tub so that if you have to get in a car and drive away, you can just go grab the tub, stick it in the car, the truck, whatever, and go. Because... Trying to pack up stuff in a panic state is a yeah. pract is a guarantee that you're not going to have what you need. That you're going to get to, and the thing is, if you get to somewhere, you're like, oh, we're, let's just go, forget everything, just just go, get in the car. Now you become a refugee because you are going to be like you and ten thousand other people are all going to be at the at the Walmart scrambling for stuff, right? But if you already have the Rubbermaid tub filled with the stuff you just put it in your car and go to wherever now you're not a refugee you know now you you're not you don't have to stand in line for two hours to get the you know the ration of bread milk you know whatever ravioli uh 
And that was, I mean, that was, has been that long ago. Uh, I, I guess we should, we need to do stuff like that more often. Talk about, uh, you know, you should have, and not only that, but I said, like, if you're part of a Patriot fire team, uh, and your, your neighbor undergoes a, you know, they get laid off from their job or their wife gets sick and she's in the hospital or whatever, you could take that Rubbermaid tub and go to your neighbor's uh, or your team member and say, here, rather than spend money at the grocery store this week, save your money, use what's in this tub. It's, you know, there's toilet paper in here, there's food, there's water, there's, you know, whatever. Use use what's in this tub rather than you having to spend your money at the store. Uh, and, you know, how easy is that? It's, you know, you just do it. Here you go. Boom. You know, or your neighbor's house floods or catch some fire and they, you're like, you give it to them. Like, take this. Uh, and it'll, uh, and you guys may have noticed that, um, that I'm wearing, I'm wearing my, uh, my beret. This is a Rhodesian green, a Rhodesian jungle green beret. And I'm, I'm doing this because, uh, we're going to be focusing on the idea, the concept, uh, and the, the, the mentality behind the citizen soldier. And we're going to be doing that as we go forward. This for basically for the next entire month, we're going to talk about the citizen soldier. So when I, when you see me with this on my head, you'd be like, ah, citizen soldier. What does that mean? What does it mean to me? I'll tell you. There you go. All right, let's go ahead and uh, if you're watching in the Discord right now and you've got questions, throw them in there, and the boys will answer them or they'll monitor them. But for now, let's jump into our uh, Duracoat finished firearm segment of the week. All right. Yes, indeed. If you're keeping up with us on our socialist media, and I always suggest that you do that, uh, I've been out playing in the snow uh, quite a bit here lately. I've been trying to make lemons, uh, lemonade out of the lemons. <laughs> like, well, we got snow everywhere. I might as well get out and play in it, right? You know, I don't have a sled. I haven't gone down the sledding hill or anything like that yet. Uh, but I've been out in the guns are fun, even in the cold. Now, we talked about uh, preparation. We talked about dura coating and how uh, essentially you don't have to have your project doesn't have to be 72 degrees Fahrenheit to work on it, but you don't want it sub freezing either. Uh, You don't want your project to be in the, you know, 32 or below Fahrenheit or zero Celsius. If you're European. Uh, And when it comes to cold, if you really want to test out your favorite gun lubricant, and a lot of the Duracoat products are self-lubricating. Remember that. Uh, but if you want to test out your favorite gun lubricant, it's not so much in the hot, although, you know, that is a thing. It's in the cold. Is your gun lubricant going to work in the cold? And so for some of you, some of you in the in the south, 38 degrees is cold. You're like, man, it was 38 at the range. I was freezing. <laughs> We went to the range, uh, and I shot my R1, the DS Arms, uh, the 308. It's actually the SA-58, but it looks like the Rhodesian R1. We were out uh, last week, and it was 4 degrees Fahrenheit on the range. We were at 6,500 feet above sea level. It was 4 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, according to the calculator, negative minus 16 Celsius for all you Europeans and Africans over there. Oh, uh, and what I used was the Echo Delta Charlie. You know what I discovered? That that people it some people get bunged up and offended when I when I describe things with <laughs> the phonetic alphabet. <laughs> but EDC CLP, it's red. It, it, I I wouldn't recommend tasting it, but it's red. It's in <laughs> it tastes like cherry. So you want to. <laughs> is it cherry or strawberry? Zach, is it cherry flavored or strawberry flavored? It tastes like you shouldn't put it in your mouth flavored. <laughs> it's strawberry flavored. <laughs> don't tell people that. Jeff be like, don't tell, please don't tell people it's strawberry flavored. Oh, 
<laughs> but it's red and it is chemically formulated to bond with it's it's chemically formulated to in a way that it's a it's above my pay grade um isn't it edccop it's a, a chemically formulated lubricant that is designed through cross pollination and molecular uh i don't you know what i mean if you know i have no idea yeah you saying. know it's like it's like yeah man yeah man it's uh now i'm trying to come up what was what, what zach you know you sell it what's the this the scientific thing it's the Alvina. It's chemically is it's formulated to be here we go. Uh improves performance, both heat uh friction, heat, contamination, carbon, dirt, synthetic based lubricant, it penetrates, da 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 da. Uh it's good stuff. Uh I've been using it for a few years now. And uh I've used it on the go fast guns, the ones that we shoot really fast. You know what I'm talking about. Wink wink, nod nod. And uh, I actually put it on the uh, the guns that we were testing out in the uh, in the cold. Now, some people out there are like, "Ah, oh, four degrees isn't that cold?" Okay, I didn't have access to to negative twenty. And the truth is, if it was negative twenty, I probably wouldn't have gone to the range. <laughs> I don't love you guys that much. I don't think I love you enough to go to the range at negative twenty. But uh, it, it was it was four degrees, so that's pretty freaking cold. And what I discovered was I went to the range, took the gun out. The gun got cold, you know, uh, shot, 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 boom, 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 shoot, 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 come back, went into the warm, disassembled the gun, and uh, the lube was still present on the bolt and, and all the parts. Um, and it did not gum up. You know, it didn't get gummy or, or pasty or, or whatever. Uh, so, yeah, if you're going to, Guns are fun, and if you really want to test them out, sometimes you need to take them into extreme environments, uh, whether it's super hot uh, or whether it's super cold. And uh, that's what we've been doing up here. We've been we've been testing them out. So that is your your Duracoat firearm finish moment. I thought I would, you know, we we like to talk about guns and and different things. I thought I thought you guys would appreciate that. And if you go to our uh, socialist media, whether it's Juxy.com or YouTube.com or Fascist Book or Insta Garbage or whatever. Uh, you can see pictures of me out in the cold shooting. Uh, and watch those from your from the warmth of your home. <laughs> How's that sound? All right. Let's, uh, let's go to the uh, mid-roll. Well, if you go to Juxy.com, that's J-U-X-X-I.com, which you should. If you are listening to the sound of my voice and you have not taken the time to subscribe to the Student of the Gun channel on Juxy.com, well, you're wrong. Uh, but you could fix yourself, and you should fix yourself right now. And uh, one of the videos that we recently put up, Zach just put it up, was the uh, the review of the ARX, the that's Alpha Romeo X-Ray, 100 rifle from Beretta. And uh, yes, they are discontinued. I wrote an article last week. So the article is out and now the video is out. So there's absolutely no excuse for you not to avail yourself to that information. Uh, long story short, there's nothing wrong with the gun. Uh, you, you there are can, a lot of things right with the gun. Yeah, there's a lot of things actually. right with the gun. But uh, if you want to know what's right with the gun, uh, go ahead and... Check it out at Juxy.com. Like I said, if you're listening to this show and uh, you have not, uh, you have <laughs> you have not ch checked it out, you should. Jared, I opened up Juxy.com and, and the one of the uh, the ads on the side says seventy percent of people have dingleberries. Yep, that's right. Get clean. It's true. Get clean. <laughs> Got to get a bidet. That's get you, get if a you bidet. To, if you don't have a bidet, you should. Funny. We, I, I if really watch that video. You go to studentofthegun.com slash juxy. It'll take you directly to the channel and you can open the video, the ARX 100. There's also a battle box review video. That's pretty cool there as well. Yeah. Check that one out. Oh, yeah. And student uh, of the gun.com slash juxy. There you go. Yeah. I, I've been going out into the, the frozen tundra into the Arctic uh, and there, there are places that if I want to go to them, I not for fun. I have to snowshoe to get there. 
The other day I, I had to check the level of propane in the tank and I had to, to get to the propane tank. I had to snowshoe to it and take a shovel with me and unbury the tank so I could check the gauge. That's pe- people from Canada are like, damn, you bitches got some snow. <laughs> like, I, <laughs> when you got Canadians that are like, damn, that's a lot of snow. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, high point firearms the makers of the 10 millimeter jxp 10 uh and if you want to check that out it's it is the gateway drug for 10 millimeter handguns if you've always wanted one if you thought man i've been hearing people talk about that and and i'm just curious you know what's it all about what's it all about well if you got uh three benjamins in your pocket uh, if you if you can come up with three Benjamins, uh, you can get yourself a JXP10. Now there's it's so inexpensive. There's tax. There's taxes and stuff, but still, you know what I'm saying. Well, if you go to a local dealer that you have a good relationship with, maybe you can say, "Hey, man, I brought, I got, I got three Benjamins. But I got that's three all Benjamins. I got. Yeah, can what, I have a tax free holiday, please? Can you? Can what? What can you do for me? Can, can yeah. you hook a brother up? Hook a brother up. Of course, you're going to have to buy the ammo, but that's okay. Uh, check them out. You have the ammo if you're smart. It might already have it. Quink, quink, not, not. All right, that is Cat in the Hat, and that be that. Oh, if you're looking for, for uh, like, super cool depleted uranium uh, shooting bears ammo or whatever with your 10 mil, get your butt over to BlackHillsAmmunition.com. They have 10 millimeter ammunition available right now in the Honey Badger. The 10 millimeter honey badger line. We are, I, I'm just, you know, when I, when I see that, I get kind of giddy uh, because we've been, how long have we been pushing team honey badger for like eight years now? Something like that. Long time. We, we push it a long time. And uh, about five years ago, Black Hills introduced, has it been five? I don't know, but they introduced the honey badger line of ammunition. And we're just like, oh, so cool symbiotic we have this symbiotic relationship uh so check out the uh, all of the honey badger line whether it's the 45 the four they got a 45 70 jared do you remember when we were there and i shot one of the first ever rounds of 45 70 honey badger into the jello mm-hmm. yeah i you know, when, when you know people you get to do stuff it's available now yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's in yeah, three eighty. Part of the R and D process. I was three eighty nine mil, forty five, ten mil, forty four special, forty four magnum. If you got all kinds a, of good stuff, yeah. if you go to black dash hills dot com, you can see a lot of the stuff that's available here. That's right. Tell them sooner the gun sent you. All right, it's new a listeners. Beautiful area up there. Oh. If you're if you get to the local area, if Dude. you're if you go to Sturgis, you're right around the corner, so you might as well just drive by anyway. Yeah, I don't think that they're open to the public, so no. the gargoyles might get you. Yeah, the gargoyles definitely will get you, but uh, you can drive by and wave. Hi. Yep. <laughs> All right, I'm going to turn it over to Zach and a hey, new listeners. Close that hole under your nose and open up your ears and listen louder. Attention new listeners. We produced a complimentary online training course called seven training tips that could save your life. Get instant access by joining the student lounge for free at studentofthegun.com. Do you watch student of the gun TV, read the blog and follow us on Facebook? If you answered no to any of these questions, you are wrong, but you can easily fix yourself. Go to studentofthegun.com to find everything SOTG. All right. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. All right. Moving on to Brownells. Brownells, uh, did you, you, you guys should have seen because we told you uh, many, many moons ago that you should subscribe to Brownells by going to what do they do? They text 556223. Yep. Or no, BRN they text BRN to 556223. Yep. And I, on my, away going on right now, on my phone this weekend, I got a, a, t- a text message. The phone was actually sitting down on the table, and Nancy's like, you got a text message? And I picked it up like, oh, I got one from Brownells because they were giving away a super barrel. They did it last year, and they did it again this year. They did a super barrel of ammo, yep. 
a five five six. I entered, so hopefully. Did you? I, I yes. was I was teasing Roy. I was like, maybe I should enter. Like, and he's like, you should. He goes, I don't have a barrel of ammo in my garage. I said, I don't either. I feel embarrassed at that fact. Well, I mean. I, <laughs> I, I feel yeah. embarrassed by the fact that I don't have a barrel of ammo in my garage, but that's okay. But here's what's going on at Brownells right now uh, is it's 2A day. What the heck is 2A day? Well, I'm going to tell you if you'd be quiet for five seconds. Uh, 2A day is the official Brownells celebration. Uh, Brownells invites liberty-minded people all across America to celebrate, uh, advocate, and join with us to defend freedom under the Second Amendment and the Bill of Rights, Second Amendment Annual Appreciation Day. It's the second Second Amendment. It's, it's the second annual second. There's there's too many twos involved here. Yeah. So on two, see, they did this last year because it was 2 2022 Yeah. All right. Yeah. But this year, it's 2 2023 but either way, the people who are sponsoring this, the Second Amendment Appreciation Day, and what they want you to do is they want you to get out, uh, get your butts out to uh, a range, and actually they have participating ranges that are listed in Florida, Virginia, Missouri, Iowa, Nebraska. And my question, if you have a range, if you have an indoor range or an outdoor range, uh, but it, it, in the, you know, where it's cold indoor ranges, why are you not participating? Uh, you can find a range in for all 48 states, not, not including Alaska and Hawaii by clicking the link. So get your butt over with, there's a link in the show notes. Uh, and on two twenty two, which is coming up very quickly here, uh, celebrate, celebrate your second amendment rights. And it's Winchester, Fiocchi, Sig, Henry, CCI, Remington, Federal. I wonder why Federal, Remington, and CCI are all sponsors, Jared. Why do you think that would be? Hmm. Yeah, I wonder. How'd, how'd they pull that off? How did they get all yeah, of them under the same umbrella? It's, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Yes, indeed. So at Brownells, they don't just talk the talk, they walk the walk when it comes to actually defending Second Amendment rights. Uh, so there you go. There you go. All right, ladies and gentlemen and children of all ages. One of the things that they did for you is they put a map. If you would like to know which state group, which state organization uh, you can support to well, that will support your rights in your state. For instance, Wyoming, it's the Wyoming State Shooting Association or Wyosa.com in Utah. Let's see, in Utah, it is the, it's the, the USSC. Utah Shooting Sports Council. That's right, the yeah. USSC. So if you are in a state where, well, you should be in a state uh, and you want to know which organization you can support, contact, uh, and work with to, supports you uh like in ohio it's the buckeye firearms association we know those guys we've known those guys for a long time um uh, the bfa the, those are guys that that uh, help push through shall issue uh and uh now ohio is a constitutional carry state so all right moving on moving on moving on do, 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 Stand by. Do. i need to look for something real quick uh there's i saw an email come in i think it was this morning no, it was yesterday, February 12th, an urgent action from the Utah Shooting Sports Council. So those of you that are in Utah, and I know we've got quite a few of you listening right now, there were some urgent actions to uh, to do, to complete. It says urgent action item number one, stop two bad bills. Urgent action item number two is support a good bill. And number three is Facebook help needed to support gun rights. And so go look for that email. There's... Uh, the bills that are mentioned are HB 354, HB 199, and and then it gives all of the representatives emails so you can send emails and whatnot. It even gives you a copy and paste email to send. So you can go do that. And HB 219 is another one. 
And so go find the email. The subject of it is urgent action alert, two actions needed to protect gun rights. Find the email and complete those actions. There you go. Get on that, hippies. Get on that. All right. Uh, And Zach, I apologize to you and you know why. All right. We'll move on and we're going to go to the student of the gun homeroom brought to you by our good friends at. No, we're not. No, we're not. This is when I be quiet and I let Zachary talk to the people and tell them what's going on. ShopSOTG.com is the perfect place to go if you are a student of the gun. Whether you want to expand your brain, increase your marksmanship, or help keep your family safe. All that, plus the pimp hand brands that you love. ShopSOTG.com has almost anything that an American patriot would want. Education, enlightenment, and entertainment, and we're open 24-7. Check out ShopSOTG.com today and see for yourself. Yes, indeed you do. And today, I'm actually not going to do the store plug. Jared is. All right, Jared, do the store plug. I'm going to do that. It's the it's for the High Elevation Precision Rifle Course. It's a, a rifle course that we're doing in Wyoming in the high elevation area of Wyoming. That's above 7,000 feet. It's yep. likely higher than you are. And uh, we're going to be doing that. It's a two-day course. And then we follow that up the next weekend with the Advanced High Elevation Precision Rifle. However, you can only join the Advanced class if you have completed the prerequisite of High Elevation Precision Rifle. So if you want to learn more about that, you can go to shopsotg.com. You can get a link directly to that. If you search for Precision Rifle, it'll pop up with the class page. You go there, you click a link on that page, and it takes you to the place you need to go to place your order and secure your seats. Uh, The first one, I believe, is July 20-something. That's a good 20-something is a good place to be. Some dates for you. (laughs) You want some dates? Precision Rifle. Yee. Loading. 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 Yes, the first one starts on July 28th. It's July 28th through the 30th. And then the next one is the following weekend, which I believe is August 5th. There you go. So, shop so let's, let's make sure, on that. My, my sons, that uh, we put in the show notes a link to that. So let's make sure we put that in the show notes. Uh, a direct link to where they can go. All right. Now that we've done that, uh, I will go ahead and introduce the student of the gun homeroom brought to you by our good friends at crossbreedholsters.com. And as a quick aside, if you are unsure as to whether you would enjoy the high elevation rifle class, uh, precision long rifle range class, uh, we have innumerable graduate reviews. Uh, If you follow the link that's in the show notes, you're like, yeah, well, I know you guys think it's a good idea, but what does the average man think? What do the graduates think? Well, a lot of these... Let me read one for you. Yeah. It says a fundamentals class that everyone should take this class along with beyond the bandage should be considered a primary class that everyone should take. In reality, a large majority of us who follow student of the gun live in an environment where we don't get a chance to get a range that has targets further than a hundred yards. This class starts at the basics at 100 yards and refines your skills up to 500 yards and beyond. So for those of you that bring rifles that can reach out further, they, we get out to at least a thousand, yards. at least a thousand. Um, yeah. While using an AR platform with 556, I was able to engage the 300 or 400 yard targets with consistency and minimal thought. This class teaches you the actual ability uh, needed to use your rifle, its full potential at range. Shot, shot placement is still number one rule. Uh, and then it, there's, it goes on after a little bit longer than that. Then Tim says that his dream was realized. Because I was so pleased to be able to have the opportunity to take this class. I was able to be with liberty-minded individuals from different walks of life and areas of the country in a most beautiful region of the country. The instruction included the basics to the advanced specifics. Professor Paul presented each important bit of instruction clearly and in such a wonderful, understandable way. Proper body position, correct trigger pull mechanics and follow through. And also how to figure out scope dope. It's all about the clicks, baby. 
The first time I hit the 1,000-yard 18 by 24 target, I thought it was great. Then hitting the target for a second time and a third and a fourth and a fifth time sent my spirit, mind, and being into the stratosphere. I learned how to work my 308 Model 700. A dream come true. The lodging was wonderful. The chef's meals were always great. Thank you to all involved at SOTG that made this possible. Yep. This is an event. It's not just a shooting class. It's an event, and you want to be a part of it. But here's the downside. There's a limited number of seats. So there's only so many seats in the class, and uh, we've already already offered this to the grad program, and a lot of them have already purchased seats. So if you want to get in, do it. All right. We are into the Student of the Gun homeroom from Crossbreed Holsters. Go to crossbreedholsters.com. Use the promotional code SOTG. Save money on a 100% made in the USA, high quality holster, and you're going to be a happy camper. They are fantastic human beings over there in Missouri uh, at Crossbreed. They will take care of you. I guarantee it. I guarantee. All right, we got a uh, question. This comes from the email bag. Jared dipped into the email bag. Uh, and uh, I'm going to let him read it, and then we'll dive into it. Yeah, this is from Eric, and he sent it to support at studentofthegun.com. He says, there are lots of knives on the market. For a good concealed combat, what would you carry? I am considering a K-bar. A K-bar. Uh, well, I tell you what, it depends on whether you want a fixed blade or uh, if you want a fixed blade knife or if you want a uh, a folding knife. I, I can tell you that if you're looking for a oh we can uh, we did we you didn't play the music did you not play Zach, the music? you want to play the music real quick no but oh, okay I, I mean, it's, yeah sure yeah play play, play the quick. music thank you. I could have swore that we did. No, because we were getting ready to, and then you guys doubled back to the Precision Rifle course and then read a bunch of reviews, and then we went to it. (laughs) Supplies. Uh, Supplies. Okay, so uh, here's what I can tell you uh, when it comes to EDC knives and carrying knives and and so on and so forth. Uh, My question to you is this, and this is a question you need to answer for yourself. Do you want a folder, uh, a a convenient folding pocket knife, uh, or do you want a uh, GTFOM um, knife? Now, if you want a GTFOM knife, I can tell you what, what you, you should get. You should go ahead and, from K-Bar at least, if you're a K-Bar fan and you like K-Bar stuff, uh, go ahead and get the TDI knife, the, the, the Tactical Defense Institute knife. Uh, we've been using those. I took a class. Uh, I took a... a, a GTFOM class. Um, I think it's called the law enforcement. The Isn't LE it? knife. It's yes. Yeah, there, yeah. there, there are actually several configurations of that knife now. It started out as just a single knife. It was one single, the LE, you know, the K bar LE knife, the TDI LE knife. And then they made another one. They made a large version, and then they made the one called the Ladyfinger, which is not a large version. And now they have one that's called the Pocket Strike, and they they've been going bananas with those knives. But the the standard TDI law enforcement knife, the weird looking one, the curvy one, uh, that is that's for the if you need to get someone to uh, GTFO you. Um, so. You have What's to ask you stand for. Yeah. 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 GTFOU. Uh, uh, Y-O-U. But uh, any who's foul. Yeah. If, if you're, if you're a K-Bar fan, we're K-Bar fans. I am a fan of K-Bar knives. Uh, I've used many, 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 many over the years uh, and been very happy with them. So uh, check those guys out. Check them out. If you need someone to. Eat. Oh, they have one that's called the Investigator. They have the investigator, they have the LE, they have the ladyfinger. They have one with a blue handle. It's called Is it a trainer? No, it's a it's a powder blue handle. Oh. Like a like an I think it's a Space Force knife. They're doing I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's for the Space Force. Uh it's called well, What's the, the difference between the LE and the investigator? Is it smaller? I think so. I think so. The 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 TDI Astro 
is uh, yeah, it's just is the favorite. Ooh, they have a serrated blade one that just in case you really hate people. Mm. Uh, yep, yeah, you know that's something we you should. You not a war crime? Uh, what serrated blades? Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess if you and if you and the person attacking you have both signed the Geneva Convention. Uh, or the Hague Accords. If you signed on to the Hague Accords or the Geneva Convention, maybe I don't know. <laughs> Isn't it by country, not by person? Yeah. No, it's, yes. But what if you're from the same country? Yeah, 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 man. Yeah, that's it. So, this yeah, it's philosophical yeah. stuff here. Okay, it is. It is. All right. So that's uh, that's my recommendation to you guys from K Bar. Uh, I can tell you, I can vouch for the T the TDI knife. I can absolutely vouch for the TDI law enforcement knife. Uh, and if you're in Southern Ohio and you want to get some good training, pop on over there and tell them that student of the gun sent you. I think that the, I'm just looking at the difference in between the investigator and the LE knife. I think the blade's actually longer on the investigator. Oh, really? But it's just shorter knife. Hmm. Yeah. So complete length on the TDI LE is five and five eighths inches. Blade length is two and fifth and five sixteenths. And the, that's basically two and a quarter. And the blade length on the investigator is 2.7 inches, which is almost 2 and um, 12 sixteenths. So that's longer. But the overall length is only 5 inches. Hmm. So, well, yep. So that's that, Mr. That's That. And uh, cool. now it is time for us to uh, to talk to our good buddy, Alex Bosco. So without further ado, the next voices you hear are going to be Jared and Alex and Zach, and uh, then we'll close it out. All right, guys, we've got uh, Mr. Alex Bosco back on with us. If you guys remember back, it's probably been a year or two because time flies, uh, especially when you have a three-year-old and an almost one-year-old. Man, time flies for me now. But we've had Alex on the show before to talk about pistol stabilizing braces, etc. And I think we brought you on specifically to talk about frack last time. And so now we uh, we went full circle. Here we are back again. And it might have even been about the same topic. I don't remember what we talked about last time, but you guys can access that show from studentofthegun.com. You just search Alex Bosco, B-O-S-C-O. Uh, search that on the site, and you can come up with the episode that we did with him before so you can get a well-rounded version of uh, who Alex is and what he's about. Well, he's the founder of SB Tactical, and he invented the first pistol stabilizing brace. And what we're here to talk about today is probably obvious to you guys, because there was just a ruling released by the ATF. And um, something that I'm concerned about is Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution says no bill of attainder or ex post facto law shall be passed. And uh, of course, that it, it creates its own issues, right? Because that seems to be what this thing is. So we thought, who better to talk about than the inventor of the stabilizing brace who has a previous and current relationship with the ATF and he can speak on uh, how what he's doing on his end to make sure that this thing is, uh, he's fighting from our side. So Alex, welcome to the show. We appreciate you coming back with us. Thanks for having me again, guys. So do you, let's just start at the base. Let's assume that there are listeners that are listening to the show right now that don't even know why would we, we would be talking about stabilizing braces right now. Um, do you want to give a little bit of backstory on what's going on? Sure. So uh, at the beginning of the month, um, at the beginning of last month, because it's February, you said time flies. I have a Crazy. 11 year old and a 13 year old and it flies just as fast as when they were young. In fact, I think it's faster as they get older anyway. Um, at the beginning of January, uh, the ATF finally, um, you know, let everybody know uh, what they wanted to do about stabilizing braces. And if people recall, about three months before that, they had um, suggested what they wanted to do. And part of their initial suggestions were, hey, we're, you know, we we think that the stabilizing braces are a public safety issue. And we need to take care of them because we've had two shootings that have been involved uh, with firearms that had pistol braces on them. And uh, we're going to come up with a system of points um, that helps the industry decide what is and what is not a brace. Now, uh, all of this is done under the guise really of two things. One, public safety, because that is ATF's 
priority. I mean, that is their number one mandate is to look after public safety. And then the other thing that they're supposed to do is that they're supposed to help us regulated people. I'm an FFL, uh, probably a few of the people that are watching our FFLs um, and manufacturers understand um, when they may or may not run afoul of the law. So in typical ATF fashion, um, as opposed to uh, the, and I'm just going to go back to 2012 when I got my first letter, I got a one pager saying, yes, you can do this. It doesn't run afoul of the ATF. Well, now after 10 years, uh, they've come out with uh, the first opinion or the first draft was 200 and close to 300 pages, I think. And they came up with a point system. They were saying, you know, if, if the brace has this, it's one point. And if you reach four points, the brace is not a brace, it's a stock. Well, after three months and 275,000 responses, the ATF essentially completely did away with their point system saying, well, everybody was complaining about the point system. We're not going to do that anymore. Uh, and they essentially made 99% of braces illegal. And the 1%, there is no dispositive idea of how you can get to the legality of it. If you guys remember, the original version said uh, one of our braces, which was the SB Mini. And remember, braces are all the same. Two rubber flaps, a strap, fit around your arm. It's not brain surgery. It's fairly easy. Uh, but they had a dispositive, uh, and by dispositive, I mean, you can arrive to understand which brace was legal. In this version, the version that they published and the version that um, in 120 days, minus whatever the past 30 some odd days, um, in this version, they're essentially saying that all braces are illegal. You have to either destroy them, register them with the federal gov government, remove them from your firearm and place them somewhere else because then you may be a foul, run a foul again of the NFA. Um, and that's it. That's the end of the story. So those are our options. And uh, the draft that they've written is obviously complex. It's complicated. It's nuanced. Uh, it's all in favor of the ATF. It's arbitrary. It's capricious. It's all of these things. So uh, that brings us to now. So if you didn't know about that, um, that is the state of affairs uh, minus a few of the intricate details, but that's the 30,000 foot view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. So it, does the ATF bring in experts on the topic to help them decide what is the best way moving forward? Or do they have internal experts? How is that? Uh, how is the information decided of what's going to go into these things? Do you have any that's insight a, into that? So that's a really good question. And I'll, I'll tell you why that's a great question. And very few people have asked me that question. So thank you for asking that question. Absolutely. So yes, ATF has the expert branch uh, of their um, of their group, which is called Firearms uh, and Technology Branch, or for Fat D. I'm not sure I'm getting it right, but it's Fat D. F A T D. Everybody calls it Fat D. How could you essentially say that? I, you can't exactly. Um, so essentially, this group are the industry experts. They're the experts and there's two sides of it. There's criminal and then there's the industry side. But essentially, these are the people that have been hired by the ATF to make the most complex decisions about firearms, what they are and what they are not. Um, so I'm going to take a step back and talk to you a little bit, you know, 20 seconds or less about Jim Jordan, who we all know is a congressman. Um, and essentially what he is starting to look at, and some of us, some of us may have seen it, is that he's talking about the how the agencies have become politicized. And the second word he uses is weaponized. Well, those two things happen when the agencies aren't functioning in the manner in which they were designed. So to go back to your question, are there experts in the agencies that make these types of decisions? The answer is yes. Well, what happens when those people who were hired to make those decisions and who are the experts are not making the decisions and instead the decisions are or have been delegated to the attorneys who are not experts in firearms? And I can tell you what happens is this 293 page monstrosity of what is and what is not a brace fundamentally. And essentially what's happened is that the agency over the years has been politicized, it has been weaponized. Um, and this is the proof that we have. Now, we know for a fact, having spoken to several of these people that work there, that they're not making the decisions anymore. It's all been delegated to attorneys. 
So what happens when you have an agency that is, um, I mean, look, we're, we're all gun folks here. A lot of us know about the nuance between carrying an SBR, carrying a pistol, carrying a rifle, understanding the, to the you know that you need to do form ones or form fours, depending on the type of firearm you have, crossing state lines. I mean, there's it's so complex. You know, none of us want to run afoul of the AT, of the NFA or the ATF because what happens if we do that? We lose that most precious right that all of us listening have, and that's our Second Amendment right. We are the most law-abiding group of folks in the ind- in any industry, I think, because nobody wants to lose our rights. And what the ATF is doing right now is so egregious and so heinous because they put all of us in a position to really not know, well, what do I do? What don't I do? For the past 10 years, I've gone from having a brace that's been approved under the Obama administration. Then towards the end of the Obama administration, they put um, B. Todd Jones, and he said, well, if you put it to your shoulder, you've now redesigned it. Most folks will remember that. Then after the shoulder to your, you know, your, to your shoulder thing, that, now they went, no, you can, you can do it. And you can, under Trump, you can have it. And there's no problem. It's perfectly legal. Then towards the end of the Trump administration, the political winds change again, and Biden comes into office. And all of a sudden, they're saying they want to ban them all together. I mean, this is the proof of politicization. And we can't have that. Not people like us. We risk entirely too much. Yeah, absolutely. And <clears throat> I'll I'll challenge your statement on um, losing rights real quick because I don't think this is my opinion. Um, I don't think that you can lose a right. I think it can be taken from you if you allow it to be taken. Sure. But all rights are found, right? <laughs> they're they're actually listed and documented. So we've found those. We know they exist. The that you can't lose them, but you can give them away or let them be taken. And um, I think it's interesting that you you're saying about how the the politicization and the ability for us to actually be able to see that it, at, um, not in a virtual way, but actually being displayed through different administrations and focusing on different things, because like you just said, you said in, in the 2012 when Obama era, when he was in office, it was OK and then it wasn't OK. And then Trump comes around and it was okay. And now there's a Democrat in office again, and now it's not okay anymore. So that is a very clear visual visualization of politicization. uh, What Jim Jordan has been saying about, Hey, we, these agencies exist for a purpose and politicization of these agencies is not okay. So what do you think that there can be done by normal folk that that didn't invent a brace or don't own a company that's in the industry? Like people that are listening to us right now, we've got some people that are business owners, but the majority of the audience is people that they like to play with guns. They believe in the Second Amendment right, and they're here to be kind of the, the choir to go preach to their friends who may or may not be on the fence. So what kind of ammunition can we give them to speak to their friends who are on the fence? I mean, look, admittedly, after all these years and dealing with this as a business owner, I am, I am demoralized. I even hate saying that out loud. Yeah. I mean, I've just, it's been, it's been so hard to have to deal with this stuff because you have people that you're hiring and then something happens politically and then you got to let people go because, you know, your business going up and down and it's all because of, you know, either the president says it's okay or it's not okay. And again, it goes back to us being law abiding folks. We don't, we don't want to get in trouble with the law. Um, so what can we do? I mean, you know, yeah, you're right. Not everybody has a business that that's enabled them to be able to fight back financially because fundamentally that's what you have to do. You have to take your money. You got to put it where your mouth is and you got to fight the federal government. I mean, that's endless not funds. easy. Yeah. Yeah. Endless. They have as much, they're using, the same money that I'm paying them, they're using to go against me. I mean, that's how messed up this whole thing is. So what can you know your average Joe do? I mean, I always tell people the same thing. Find a group you like. It doesn't, I, I the, the foundation that I work with is FRAC. Uh, we've spoken about that before. Uh, it's an industry foundation. Okay. But so it fights for industry partners, manufacturers. Um, but there's a lot of other groups out there. I mean, there, there's the NRA, which a lot of people have problems with, but I got to tell you, the NRA, they are funding half of our lawsuit. 
Like they are literally putting their money where their mouth is and helping us fight the ATF. Like that to me, that's a big deal. That's a really, really big deal. So, you know, kudos to him, Jason Wiemet, uh, Josh Savani, who nobody knows. He's like in the background, but he's one of the attorneys for the NRA. These are younger folks. You know, they're not, the, they're not, they're guys that are, I would say our age, you know, between their, their, their twenties and the late forties, early fifties. Um, and they're starting, they're changing my mind. I mean, the NRA to me, I mean, they really stepped up where nobody else did, but if it's not the NRA, then look at GOA, look at FPC, you know, look at the Second Amendment Foundation, look at whoever you want to go to, you need to go and help those folks out. Even if it's like, even if it's a $5, like here's five bucks, you know, we can afford five bucks. We take our kids to Starbucks and we're spending 30 bucks. Yeah. You can spend five bucks to, to one of the groups that you like. It doesn't have to be my group. I'm, I, you know, I don't want to say it's just frack. It's whoever you want. Um, but it's got to be somebody. And, it, and if it's not an organization, a grassroots organization, then the one thing you can do, and it's really easy, is find out who represents you in your area. Reach out. There's so, it's such an easy thing to do to look online, find out who your representative is, and you can send an email. It takes all of about five minutes, uh, if that. So you got to do something. I mean, I don't know what it is. Uh, you know, I don't know how much time all, a lot of people are working two, three jobs now. Um, and a lot of people don't have the financial backing or even wherewithal to know where to go, but it's fairly simple. You know, even if you go to a gun store, they'll let you know who to talk to, but do something, anything. Yeah. I was just taking some notes here. So specifically mentioned were frack, obviously that's frackaction.org. Um, it's mm -hmm. the firearms regulatory accountability coalition, and that's the one that Alex is part of. And then you've got the NRA, which he said is helping fund half of the lawsuit. That's a that's massive. That's a big deal because lawsuits, especially against the federal government, are not cheap. And uh, I was talking with a friend of mine the other day, and we came to the conclusion that the process is the punishment. It's not the outcome. It's what you're having to go through. That's the punishment. And the de demoralization is probably the goal, right? Because if you can demoralize somebody, then and and they don't have any support then that's a, a massive thing. It's like, okay, well, they're going to quit fighting. I'm not it's saying worse. Alex is going to do that because, oh, go ahead. It's worse than that because I'm the one getting demoralized and I'll take one for the team, okay? Yeah. But when they do it to the public, their job, and not their job, but they're, they're, they're not trying to demoralize the general public. They're trying to instill fear. That's what the ATF is doing. That's what the federal government is doing. They want to put doubt in your mind that you are going to run afoul of a federal crime. And therefore, you're either not going to buy that product. You're not going to buy that firearm. You're going to stay away from it. And they're trying to chill the market. That's worse than demoralizing me. And I, I think it's bad what they're doing, what they've done to me, to my business. And it's been up and down. And it's just been this, this nightmare of, of it's not a re I don't run a regular company. I mean, when you deal with the federal government, like the way I've been dealing with, it's not regular. And yes, it's demoralizing. But again, it's worse what they're doing to, to, to Joe Smith or, uh, you know, U.S. citizen who's just trying to, you know, he's, he's doing the right thing. I'm not talking about criminals. I'm talking about law abiding citizens. Mm -hmm. They're buying a product, you know, and, and going to a store and they're going through a background check because they're buying pistols with braces on them. And you're trying to intimidate them by saying that you're going to go to prison if you own this thing. That's bad. That's I'm, really bad. I'm pretty sure that that's close to the definition of tyranny is, is ruling by yeah. fear, ruling through fear. And mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's self-censorship, right? It's like, it's like uh, the YouTube algorithm is cracking down on people that are gun content creators. And what it's forcing them to do is self-censor their content so that it's not showing things that the algorithm doesn't want the video to show. Well, that's way easier than forced censorship, right? Because now you've, you've conditioned the people that are, that are either using the item or producing the content to censor themselves. And they've changed the way that they operate in their daily lives to appease the platform or the agency or whoever it is. And so self censorship, while it might take a little bit longer to achieve, I think for the long term 
the longevity of the idea that is way more impactful than forced censorship because that when it go when forced censorship goes away then it, it's not poo pooed upon and nobody really changed their their daily habits through choice it was forced upon so self censorship i think is more impactful and uh, man i'm glad that you you mentioned that you think it's more of a problem for the everyday joe average joe uh, the everyday us citizen who is law abiding than it is for the business owners because i know i've i've got a lot of friends in the industry and it's like man it's it gets tough for them sometimes but you're absolutely right the governance and ruling and creating fear for the citizens is is a, a big thing as well and um that's man that's I, i've read a, a lot of books lately i just got new glasses and I didn't realize that my glasses before were part of the problem with my reading because I get headaches every once in a while. And and uh, I just didn't think about it because I'm a, a stubborn dude. So I got new glasses and I was like this reinvigorated love for reading. And so I've blown through a few books. Some of them were uh, in the Holocaust timeline and what some of the kids had to go through. And there's there are some alarming correlations to the early days of the Holocaust. Right. It's it not quite when you get to the mass murders yet, but the things that happened before the ghettos that led to that, there are some alarming correlations there. And I don't know if it's, if it's purposeful or if it's just the way humanity is, it's like from reading books, it seems that it's a cyclical thing where uh, I don't remember the exact uh, forms of government that are cyclical, but it essentially said like communism leads to, more freedom and then more freedom leads to less freedom. And then it's just this giant circle. Um, the Titler cycle says that strong men lead to good times. Good times lead to weak men and weak men lead to hard times. So it's, it's similar to that, but it's in the forms of government. But um, so I want to dig into the invention of the brace for a little bit. If you've got enough time for that, yeah, I'm here. Why, why did that happen? Why is this brace even available on the market? Well, I mean, it, the inception was me at a range. Uh, there was a, uh, a wounded warrior that was there. And um, it was essentially the range officers. Let's call it fault because he was being overly eager uh, with somebody who had an issue while he was shooting at the range. And it I think it was more anger was I keep telling people anger was the original impetus. I was like, how could you tell somebody who's got, you know, a problem shooting to bench the gun? It seemed a little bit too much. And we've all seen those ROs before. I mean, you get to some of these ranges and, you know, you have to have, you know, three seconds between each shot. And, you know, there's, there's ranges that are like that. Um, and so I went home that evening and my first brace was fashioned out of, uh, I don't remember if it was a camera case or if it was like a gun box but it had the foam inside of it and i pulled the foam out and i took some hundred mile an hour tape and i essentially you know was like well if you you know put this over your arm you can strap it to your arm and um went back the next day to try and kind of go the, or the range officer and he was like oh no you you're probably good to go with that you might want to ask the atf and at the time i was you know i had been overseas for 13 years like i i didn't know about sbrs i didn't really know about any of that I just saw this gun and I was like, oh, well, you can strap something to it. And I wrote a letter to the ATF. Well, first I got, and that was a story in and of itself, but I, at first I went to a patent office locally and you have to do all these things like to figure out if you can get a patent. Anyway, I did all that. And I, I kind of like simultaneously, I wrote to the ATF and um, I, I sent them the letter on November I think it was November 17th when I sent them, I submitted the letter of 2012. I got it back on November 27th, I think. So I think about that, like back in the day, you could That's write quick. to ATF in 10 days, they turn around and they tell you, yeah, you're good to go. You're not making an SBR. And I was like, oh, this is easy. And now think about that now, even one of the lawsuits that, that, that FRAC is working on is not even being able to get a response from Fat D. Like they're not even giving you a response. And the reason I could tell you why they're not giving you a response is because it's a political issue. They don't want to give you yes or no, because they want to be able to, again, this is the ATF. And again, we're getting away from how, what happened, the original, um, the inception of the brace, but we're, the ATF wants to be able to be as vague as possible so that they can have 
you know, essentially be the overlords and say, ah, now you can't do that. And you ask them, well, what part of that can I do? Well, you know, we'll know it when we see it, which is called the porn test. Like, you know, we asked them for years, like, what is a brace? Can you tell me it's a length of pull? Okay, what's the length of pull I need to do to make sure that it stays a brace? Well, we'll know when we see it. Well, it's surface area, they tell you. Well, okay, well, how much surface area? What's the surface area that needs to be under? Well, I can't tell you that. We'll know when we see it. I mean, how is somebody, and fundamentally, like, we can talk about this for an hour, but fundamentally, and it goes back to what you were just talking about, about what happened you know, in, in pre-World War II Germany, what the, what the Nazis essentially put the Jews through um, and the Roms and a whole bunch of other groups. But essentially, you have the, the government that is saying, and in our case, this is our government, or the executive, because the ATF is part of the executive. And the question should be, should an executive agency be able to come, with, uh, come up with rules that have criminal implications, okay, on U.S. citizens without going through the legislative process. We all, I mean, if you're young, yeah, we were all young enough, if I'm young and old enough to remember that cartoon that we used to watch, I'm just a bill on Capitol Hill, and it goes through the process, you know, the House, you know, shows this is the bill that they want to propose, it goes to the Senate, the Senate approves it, it goes to the president, the president signed it. Well, in this case, that process never happened. The ATF took a definition from the National Firearms Act, which was an act of Congress drafted in 1934, took a definition out of it, which was the definition of rifle, and they added stabilizing brace to a definition that was drafted in an act of Congress. Hmm. And essentially what that does is it makes everybody in possession of a stabilizing brace on top of a firearm in possession of an NFA firearm. That's making a law. There's a felony implication there. Do you want, and I would, so the question to Democrats is, because it's not a Democrat Republican thing, is do we want any agency being able to, any bureaucratic agency, and especially a branch of the executive, coming up with laws? No. Even if the, the government's dysfunctional, I get it, okay? But you can't, you can't have an, a, a branch of the executive, unelected bureaucrats coming up with laws. That is the fundamental question about all of this that we're talking about. And uh, man, I completely agree with you. That was a question that I was going to ask later on, but we'll dig into it now and then we'll get back to the or- origination of the brace. Yeah. The purpose of this ruling that came from the ATF is to for citizens to follow the rules, right? Is to have them follow that ruling. What doesn't make sense to me is if we're expected as, as a law abiding citizens of the United States of America, if we're expected to follow the rules, then the rules that are in place need to be made by following the rules, right? It, yeah. it just, it's so meta. It just doesn't make sense to me. It's like, Hey guys, if you like, how about you lead by example? And then people probably won't have as much of an issue, right? It's like, we, we have this document And these laws that are in place, it's like, hey, first, you can't have an ex post facto law. You cannot pass that. Second, like maybe first is you have to go through the legislative process to make a law. And then the second thing is you can't pass an ex post facto law. Like, so there's there's two violations, blatant violations right there. Who knows? I'm not even an attorney. And I figured that out. So who knows what an attorney can figure out? I think what you mean is retroactive. You can't have a law that retroactively makes it like ex post facto. I think is after the fact. Like, yeah, I guess after the fact, yeah. you can't make people criminals. But I think the term that in all of the documents we're talking about, and I've read these documents a million times now, but it, it so I'm confusing some of the terms. But the term is retroactive. In other words, right years ago, you said it was okay, and for years we've had this. It's ten years. It was actually ten years of the day when I was at Shot Show that it was approved, but. Oh, and wow. now you're saying you can't. So yeah. you were saying you were saying first you have to be able to make a law. You can't do it like retroactively. I mean, there's a bunch of other things. I'm assuming you could go off there on. I would go right. crazy yeah. on what on yep. what you, what you should or shouldn't be doing. But it's um, I don't know, man. I'm a, I'm a, I'm quite a bit emotional about it. If you can't tell, I mean, it's been something that I've been doing for so many years now. I I just. Uh, I keep saying to people and a lot of people reach out to me, like I keep saying, not under my watch, man. not if, if it takes every last time I've ever made, I'm fighting for this. That's a noble cause. 
And I have a, I think a it's, friend a, it's of mine a just who, cause who says the noble things are difficult. Just cause that yeah. is, it's very true. Yeah. So uh, I want to hit on this again, real quick that frack NRA GOA and FPC. So national rifle association, obviously gun owners of America, and then the firearms policy coalition and then frack, which Alex is a part of. Those are the four things that we discuss specifically where you can go and actually put your money where your mouth is as a, a viewer, a listener. And like Alex was saying earlier, he's like, man, five, even $5. If you, if you take $5 and you donate it a million times, that's $5 million. That's a big, that, that would help a lot, right? So when you're donating to these places that are helping secure your rights and make sure that they're not stolen from you, just think about that. It's like, okay, if I give $5 and a million other people give $5, that's perfectly fine. You don't have to, if you have the means and you're able to do it, then hundreds or thousands, tens of thousands of dollars would be awesome. But if you're not in that, if you're not in that space in life, it's totally fine as well. So five bucks, a dollar, just whatever you can spare to these people. Cause it's, it's a big thing that's happening. And uh, I think that we're at a time in history now that it's going to be looked back upon a lot in the future between, you know, the last three years have been kind of revealing with, with what humans do with uh, stress and fear and all that stuff. So I think it's an interesting time to be alive and be experiencing life. Uh, so let's go back to the origination of the brace. Uh, so we've got, you, you wrote to the ATF to, and you got a response in 10 days. And that was with basically hundred mile an hour tape, uh, a prototype that you did with hundred mile an hour right. tape and fun. I, I, we, we say hundred mile an hour tape. I'm sorry. It's a, that's like a term to gear. That's like uh, when you're in the army or in the Marine Corps, yeah. hundred miles. I think it's actually thousand mile an hour tape now because now it holds even more, but it's like gorilla tape. Yeah. Just think yeah. like duct, duct tape is hundred mile an hour tape for those who don't know. Yeah. Cool. So it was with that and foam was the original prototype of this thing. And uh, so then you, you went and you looked at the patent capabilities and apparently, obviously you were able to get them at that point in time or did it take longer? No. So the, yeah, the, the patent part, you know, it's, I get so many calls from, from young, you know, industry members, young kids that are coming up with these new ideas. And like the first thing I tell them, well, the first thing I tell them when they call me and they want to talk to me about their idea is, you like I'm trustworthy, but not everybody is trustworthy. NDA, get some kind of non-disclosure agreement. Get an attorney to draft something to say that I'm going to talk to this guy about my idea, and the idea is mine. Nobody's going to steal it because I can't tell you how many people over the years are like, oh, you know, uh, I did this, and you know, I did. It's like people want to jump on the minute they they sniff money out, they want to come after you, and it's just make sure that you do that. And fortunately, I did that. It protected me ultimately. Um, that's another story in and of itself. But once you have the NDA um, and somebody comes to me with their ideas, you, you, you have to find a group of good IP attorneys because essentially what's going to happen is, is they're going to look at this product and look at, they have to do something called a prior art study. Mm -hmm. And what a prior art study is, is they look through all of the, um, you know, the, the IP law books, the patent books, and they see if there's something in there that is either similar um, or the product that you've you know, identified is completely different than anything anybody's ever done before. And at the time, they couldn't find anything about you know, my product attached to this type of firearm in the manner in which I did it. So they gave me a preliminary, um, a preliminary patent or something like that. I forget the name of the word. But when that was all done, this was, this was like, it was probably December 2012, SHOT Show 2013. Um, I had gone there, I had made, like, I had bought like a rubber kit. I think it was from Hobby Lobby or something like that. And I made like this, I made like the outline of it in styrofoam and then I filled it and we made like these, essentially they were molds of the braces that I went to SHOT Show with. And, um, I had also started a, it was like a go, I had a GoDaddy website. I had gone onto AR15.com and I'm like, Hey, I got approval. This is what I'm doing. And I started this little website and like they, they called me after like the people from GoDaddy blocked my website. I'm like, what's going on? And my, and my email address, they're like, you're getting spammed. And I'm like, what do you mean I'm getting spammed? Well, I wasn't getting spammed. I was getting like thousands of emails saying, Hey, I want to buy your product. I want to buy your product. So it like crashed my, the, they stopped my, my email address. 
So by the time I got to Shotcha in 2013, a lot of people had heard about it. And they're like, oh, you're that guy that started this, this brace thing. And I went to all these different companies and um, I ended up going to the two companies that I really liked meeting with were Six Hour and Century Arms. And Six Hour, I met with this guy, Jeff Creamer, who was product development at the time. And he had, he had heard about the brace thing. And they're like, we have to have this thing. And it wasn't the best offer I got. And I told that Jeff, Jeff in the past. But the thing is like, um, so Jeff Creamer now runs SP Tactical. He's the president and CEO of SP Tactical years later. Um, but when we chat about it, it's funny because I think he... It's funny how sometimes money is not the issue. I could have made more money with other people, but somebody comes up to you and they make a really good impression. He's like, listen, I really want to do this with you. And Six Hour was obviously like a monster company. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think they are what like 10 years ago, I think they've really grown in the past 10 years. They were big back then. I think they're really big now. Um, but at any rate, we started selling them. And six months later, I think we had sold when we first came, we came at it. It was, it was shot show. And that was NRA, which was probably like four months later. We already had them at, like they were at the, at, at the SIG booth. And we had sold, I think like, 50, 60,000 in the first four months, three months. That's good. That's a success right there. Yeah. It's the American dream, man. It you was know, just it, like, uh, yeah, people, when they have this idea and they, they go through the development process and you finally have the, the finished product and you're like, this is amazing. You kind of have that high. Right. And then yeah. and you're like, man, I hope this, I hope I sell a thousand of these. That'll be, you know, do you remember what your original goal was? Like what success would have been that first week? I think you, I think you said it. I was like, man, if we could sell a thousand of yep. these, you know, and I, and I mean, look, I just to explain to you my situation, just real quick. Like I had come back to the U S my wife is a foot was a foreign national. She, she's a U.S. citizen now, but my kids were born in Italy. My wife is Italian, like from Italy. I was living in Italy. I moved back to the States. My mom had been diagnosed with cancer at the time. And I was like, all right, well, I'm just going to stay back here at home. Um, we decided to stay. I had to find a job. I didn't have a job. My wife didn't have a job. We had uh, a six month old and a two and a half year old at the time. And I was like, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, I wanted to be a cop, but it was hard to become a cop at the time. And it was just like it, that, that never, you know, materialized. I mean, when all of this happened, it was like, it was like winning the lottery. So my first numbers to go back to that, I was like, well, okay. I mean, if they order, I think the first thing I was like, well, if they order a thousand and then the guy that I, Grant Shaw, who's the guy that I, I started the business with, he's like thousand, man, we got to sell 10,000 of these. I mean, we went from 10,000 to like 60,000 like Like that, that. you know? And then obviously we millions that now it's millions of braces are out there now. So that's amazing. That's an awesome success story. Uh, I do. I consult with companies and one of the things that we do at my agency is we help people define what is success and then what do we have to do to get there? And I, I'm constantly amazed at the the rather low number. Like a thousand's a pretty decent that that's a pretty decent goal, right? From a dude that's like, I made this thing, I have this thing, let's do this. And and that, I assume that was your first business. Is that correct? No, no, I actually had a business in Italy as well. I was always I'm like a serial entrepreneur. Yep. I was in the military too, but once I got out of the military, I think everybody who gets out of the military is like, I don't want to go work for anybody anymore. <laughs> I want to do something for myself. So I had yeah. something that I was work. I had a decent business in Italy and then, you know, the economy kind of changed and I told you about my mom. And so I was just like, let's start, start something new here. So I do have a, the entrepreneurial background. Put it that that's, way. that's good. Yeah. You and me both, man, uh, serial entrepreneurs. But uh, so the consulting thing with deciding or helping people figure out what's possible and, and uh, what, what success is, uh, I was constantly amazed at the, the number that people would give me. It's like, okay, well, if we make this amount in the first month, then that would be success to us. I'm like, that's great. That's probably a reasonable expectation, but let's not get, let that get in the way of what is possible. And it's one of those things where you, you like 60,000 units in four months is probably something you're, you're, you never conceptualize. Cause that's a lot. That's a, it's, a, it's like, how am I going to produce that many? but you already had that figured out with partnering with a company. So uh, it's, it's just, that's an amazing story that I would, uh, we'll have to well, dive into that on a different show. Cause I could talk yeah. to you about that for a long time. I mean, real quick though, like I, I never, I scrambled and, and we'll talk about it another time if you want, but I scrambled because what I decided to do was not 
to let them make it. The decision was made that my partner and I were like, we're going to make it. Ah. So once they start, once we started getting these orders for like, you know, 15,000, 20,000, I had to find somebody quickly to make a mold and to be able to make them en masse for me. I mean, and that's the problem. It's not so much coming up with a good idea. It's following through on that idea. And when you start taking orders, because you can really mess yourself up. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, you can make a bad name for your te- for yourself and a bad reputation. And luckily we did it. We were able to scramble and do the right things at the right time. Some people, when they have a pressure applied to them, they, they turn into diamonds. Some people, when they have pressure applied to them, they fall apart. You, sir, turned into a diamond. <laughs> well, I mean, I always tell people the same thing. Um, and my wife hates it when I say it because she's like, you're putting yourself down when you say that. And it's, I'm not putting myself down, but I, I, I was never the best Marine. I was never the best soldier. I was both in the army and in the Marines. Um, and I, I've never been, let's say the best person to do any one job in a business. But what I've always been good at is one thing. And it's, it's been like all throughout my career in, in the military and all throughout my businesses. Um, and even in sports, it was, uh, my, my, my saying is I'm able to find the right people. Okay. So I'm always good at finding the right folks. I'm always good at giving them the tools I need, but then the one ingredient you need to be able to do, and I'm sorry, I'm going to drop a bad word, but you got to get the fuck out of the way. That's what you have to do. That's hard. So you, that's hard to do because it, you, it's something that you're making, but you have to let the right people Okay, that you've chosen. So you're responsible whether they fail or not. It's really on you. It's not on them because you've chosen those people. But the minute you've chosen those people, let them run with it. You'll be surprised what people can do. Micromanagement is the death of any industry. You need to let people run with what they do. I agree. Uh, To get a bit meta for those of you that are listening right now, I learned that the hard way. And the reason it's meta is because Zach was my the, the person that I learned on. Zach, who's with us, the shipping ogre, he's the producer of the show. Howdy. And going, so in my early days of business management, and I think it's different because it's family, right? Zach's my brother. I also managed other people that I was a 21 year old managing people in their fifties and sixties. And we did fine there. I I wasn't as much of a, of a micromanager, but for whatever reason with family, it was different. And I probably still do to a degree. Uh, If you ask Zach, we'll probably have completely different conversations if you ask us differently in separate rooms. But I think that, you know, in the early days of managing a family business, I didn't get out of the way quick enough. I was always there to micromanage because I wanted it. I I have this this idea of the way that the thing needs to be done. And I have a little bit of OCD, which goes a long way with building things, Mm -hmm. but not with managing people. And so I would I do that. But then. You know, a couple of years ago, and Zach, correct me if I'm wrong here, but a couple of years ago, I just decided through stuff that I had learned through uh, seminars and 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 people that I have that consult with me, I was like, you know what, I just need to step back and let him do his thing because he probably will do it better than I could do it anyway. And uh, and through that, you guys have seen the you know the quality of the show, the videos that go out, the the YouTube shorts or TikTok, Instagram, whatever it it is, the short videos, like that stuff that I would have never done and followed through with myself but because i stepped out of the way zach took the initiative and was like hey i think we should do this and uh, so it's a, it's a real life meta example for you guys that are listening to the show uh, zach do you have um, correct me if i'm wrong there do you have anything to say on that topic no i'd say you, you've got definitely gotten a lot better about just kind of allowing me to do what i need to do and not like and sit like as back in the old days it was like everything i did i needed to hit you up and have you approve it first Yep. So now, whenever it, whether it's like a clip from the radio show or the radio show itself or editing an article Dad sends me, et cetera, et cetera, like you'll, you'll look at it after the fact, but you you don't get into the process anymore, really. Yeah. And one thing that you said, Alex, was choosing the right people. And what I got out of that is, if you choose the people, then if you've chosen them, then you believe that they can do the thing the best. They're they're the best option to do the job. So why not get out of their way? Right. And that's what I struggled with for a little while. I'm like, okay, well, you know, I need to be there to help this person because I want them to be successful. I didn't, it took me a couple of years to figure out. It's like, why can't I just, why, why do they need me to be successful? (laughs) That's kind of an arrogant statement, right? Yeah. 
I agree. I'm, and, and again, like, this is uh, the, the subject we're talking about here. Um, short of getting into all the braces and you know how it happened and the, the politics of it, is probably what I talk about. Maybe thirty to forty percent of my time, because people want to understand how did you get to do what you did. Okay. And, and, you know, short of me kind of giving that, that 30,000 foot view, it's a very deep dive into, um, how quickly your success can be erased. Um, you know, what it takes to maintain the success. I mean, people, you got people that make money just talking about what we're talking about. Yes. It's what they do, you know? Um, and I think it comes naturally to some people. Um, I don't have any particular gift. Like I told you, I am not the best at anything. In fact, I would say that the people that work for me are far better at doing what they do than I would ever be able to do. Um, you know, other things I do better, but that's, it's, you know, it's more on the other side. It's not, um, it's not into the mechanics of it. I'm not going to, my wife was the CFO of the company without her. I, I don't have any kind of financial nugget in my brain. Like there's not, I don't do money, you know, tell me what I can do. Like my, uh, my thing with her at the very beginning was, this is what I want to do. And I would go to her and I would say, I need this, this, and this. How do I get from point A to point B? And she would say, well, this is what you got to do to get to point A to point B. Then it was up to me, Mm -hmm. but I needed to understand if I had the, the financial ability to do that. Um, Some people have that, you know, you think about Steve jobs or those guys, like those guys were just, machines. They didn't really need anybody around them. There's very few people like that. If you're not like those people and you're more like me, surround yourself with the right people, make the right choices. Tell my kids every day, it's the same thing. They leave the door, I drop them off at school, make good choices. It sounds silly. It sounds stupid. It sounds mundane, but making good choices is what allows you to have a good life or a bad life. And it's, it's little things. It's not even the big things. It's little things. It can be big things like your life partner. That's the most important choice you will ever make. The partner you, you take for, for the rest of your life, your wife, whoever it is, that is the most important decision you will ever make. Not talking about braces now, though. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we just got a comment in here from Doug. He says, this show is so fascinating. Uh, and that's one of the things that I appreciate about you is you're a multidimensional human where you can talk about many different things and you're, you're, you're more open than a lot of people are about how you got where you are, what you need to do to stay there. And then, you know, the processes that you have to go through to fight for people's rights too, because that's what you're doing, man. You're you and your organization are fighting for the rights of people like me and, and Zach and, and everybody that's listening here. And we really appreciate that. Um, um, like I keep saying, not on my watch, not on my watch guys. Cool. Well, uh, I, it's been almost an hour now, man. So I'm going to, I know you're a busy dude. I'm going to close up, wrap up this interview and then we'll drop it into, uh, one of the post-produced episodes. And it looks like dad's actually looking to join the show now. So he must be done recording with Marty. Uh, Zach, go ahead and let him in and we'll have a quick chat with Alex and dad. Yeah. So we're, we're, we Hello. just got to the point where we're wrapping up the show and then you popped, you, I saw a little thing that said, professor Paul wants to join. So I figured bring him on and, and let's uh, have a chat for about probably four to five minutes and then we'll let Alex go. All right. Fantastic. Fantastic. I'm sure that you guys did a fantastic job. I know you're all professionals and I, I don't have to worry about that. Bless. <laughs> yeah. I, I heard what we just said. Yeah. Bless Marty's heart. Uh, yeah, he he had a, a schedule, and he had two guests, both flake. And he, he had to send Alex over to Marty's show. That's true. That's true. <laughs> that's true. I'm sure he would be happy to have you. Are I'm you sure connected you. with uh, Marty from Talking Lead, Alex? I know who he is. I don't know that I've done his show before. Maybe I have. I've done so many. Like the past two weeks have been crazy. I mean, I think yeah, it's been like I think it's been sometimes three to four shows a day. Yeah. So it's been a lot. Yeah, good. It keeps you young. You're I doing the so. circuit. Yeah, that's Is that nice. what it's called? Uh, doing the circuit? Yeah, yep. the circuit. Doing the show circuit. I'm doing the show <laughs> circuit. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh man. Remember last time we were on, uh, when we had Alex on and, and I was texting Alan, I was like, dude, you mess with Alex Alan? doesn't like us. Like, I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> and I that's sent it true. and then I put my phone down and Alan's on the other end. Like, He's like Ah, He's like, well, what's going like, on? I don't know. No, sorry, he, really, he likes you for real. 
I was just kidding. <laughs> uh, I've got cool. a face for radio though, guys. So it's not, uh, this is not my thing when we're doing like people see who I am. I'm just not the best looking guy. I wish I was a little bit different looking, but you know, I don't have those beautiful beards that you guys have. Uh, it yeah. just doesn't work on me. <laughs> well, look at that good tea on that guy. So, I mean, look at that. Look yeah. at that. That's funny. Uh, my, mine is mine is full of gray. Yeah. Uh, he dyes it gray so that he doesn't make other people so I look his age feel bad. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly that's it exactly. <laughs> So uh, th those of you that are still listening here, if you want to help Alex and support Alex and his organization, you can obviously buy the braces, right? <laughs> uh, but you, you can. can also go to frackaction.org. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Frack Action, or like we said, whoever it is that you want to give money to, do something. You know, I mean, Frack is the organization that I work with. There are a lot of organizations out there. Make sure they're legitimate and make sure that you're helping them. And if you don't do that, call your representative, send an email. That's super easy. So whatever it is, it's gotta be something. I mean, you can't just, uh, you can't just do nothing. Put it that way. That's right. So frackaction.org, Alex, we really appreciate having you on here. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Anytime guys, you just call me when you need me. Thank you, Alex. All right. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, thank you for being here. We truly appreciate it. Uh, we also appreciate you guys being uh, fans of and uh, and participants and users of the Student of the Gun SOTGU podcast. That is single topic, easy to digest, short form. It is a separate show, SOTGU podcast. You can find it exactly where you find this. And this week, we're going to talk about the importance of marksmanship. You do not want to miss it. Trust me. Trust me. So there you go. There you go. All right. Until the next time we're all together, remember, you're a beginner once. You're a student for life. Thanks for staying until the end. Want to water the seeds of freedom we planted together today? Head over to wherever you listen to us and leave a like, rating, or review. It makes a big difference. Have a show topic submission? We would love to hear it. Submit it to info at studentofthegun.com. A delightful human will get back to you faster than you can finish a one-box workout. Remember to check studentofthegun.com often for new and free content, giveaways, and more. Watch, listen, read, shop, and connect at studentofthegun.com.